Okay. So um, good morning. This is the final session of our organic production webinar series. And um, this morning we have with us um, Blackius. And um, she is a researcher in uh, agricultural economics. Very happy to have her with us this morning. Um, she does research on agricultural and food supply chains, looking specifically at motivations around welfare implications like sustainability and fairness, and um, also looks at market influences of uh, farm organizations um, and other food system stakeholders acting collectively um, in Ohio and beyond. So uh, she's going to talk to us today a little bit about the organic consumer and uh, what we know about them. So I will turn it over to her. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cassandra. And, and thank you to those of us who are, are joining live. And if you watch this recording later, I'm glad you found your way to the recording on the website. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy that the winter is no longer applicable. Um, <laughs> for this series personally. Very happy it's spring um, and to be rounding, rounding this out. Um, so uh, I will just uh, jump right in here. Um, on the agenda for today is kind of answering a series uh, or providing a little bit of evidence at least uh, to answer a series of big questions. Um, and these are, these are the big questions and I, I won't read them out, but these are the big questions that I wanna focus on today. Um, and hopefully you find them um, useful and applicable um, to you and to your operation, whatever way that you engage um, in organic markets. So the first big question is how big is the market for organic? Just to give us some context. Um, the, so this is from the Organic Trade Association, which does really great tracking uh, of organic food sales. And uh, so organic food sales have been growing overall. Um, and as a share of total food sales. So you see on the bottom row, um, there's organic as the percentage of the total. So we've been, we're now up um, in 2019, we're at 5.8% uh, of total food sales. Um, and, uh, and then on the top gives you like the absolute, um, the absolute level uh, of, of sales. And this is in millions. So that's not 50,000, 50, but um, uh, it's, it's much, 50,000 millions, billions. So uh, that's our size. And uh, this is another uh, quick graphic from uh, the Organic Trade Association. So uh, organic non-food sales, I'm mostly gonna talk about food because I think about food system, but I just wanna mention um, the importance of organic non-food sales. There are a small share of all organic sales, but they're experiencing faster growth. So if you look down at the right-hand side, um, you see that organic food, at 2019 growth was 4.6%, but organic non-food was 9.2%. So um, very small as a share um, total, but growing at a faster rate. So um, for those who are also in um, participating in uh, production and sales and marketing of non-food items, this is something to kind of pay attention to and think about. Um, in addition, I think this is a really um, interesting uh, kind of characterization of organic production. Um, this is from, so all of the papers that I reference are hyperlinked. Um, some of them are going to have, uh, are going to have Paywalls, um, if you hit a paywall and you wanna read something, don't hesitate to email me. We have access to all of these things through Ohio State. Um, some of them are going to be, um, are going to be open access. Um, Cassandra, I see we have something maybe in the chat. Is there, um, maybe you could uh, manage the chat if any, if any questions. Yeah, no, up. it's just me saying, if, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in. Oh, the great. Well, thanks for asking we'll that. Okay, to it. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just saw the little number. Great. So. Um, so what I think is interesting about this is just to give us a global context, we see on the far right, um, we see the, uh, the light green is North America. So organic retail sales are, um, are focused uh, in North America and Europe is yellow, um, but organic area and organic farmers are actually larger in other parts of the world. So um, certainly uh, I expect that most of the folks who are on here today are involved in organic production or organic markets in Ohio, but one of the things that I'm sure you're thinking about is organic trade, right? Which is something that, that is um, increasingly a kind of a topic of discussion, especially if there are concerns about certification differences um, across countries. So it's given that we operate within a global food system, it's, I think this is nice context to provide of where, um, where organic 
production is happening in terms of area, where organic farmers are, uh, et cetera. So organic is really global. A lot of what I'm gonna provide is US context because that's where we are. Um, but I, I think this is important to kind of consider as we move forward. Zoe, let me interrupt you for just a second. Yeah. We had a question um, on the chat uh, after all, and it's uh, yeah. is organ organic non-food. So I'm thinking like yeah. organic sheets and uh, cotton and that kind of thing, but maybe you could expand on that a little. Yeah, so um, this would, uh, this would be, you know, various types of certainly certainly materials. Uh, there's an area of literature that's in the kind of fashion and kind of product marketing area there that has to do with organic cotton. Um, there could be things that are non-food items like flowers or something something like that, a non-food product in that arena. There could also be um, products that are made with organic ingredients. So even something like a cleaning product or some kind of other other um, product like that, that that has some organic elements to it. So uh, it could consist of a variety, a variety of those, those things. I see a couple other comments popping up in the chat. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Julia's um, chiming in here. So she mentions body care products. Um, yep. Oh, good. Yep. Foods, probably health supplements as well. I don't know if that's considered food or not. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if the Organic Trade Association and their number considered supplements as food. I would imagine that they did, um, mm -hmm. but uh, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks. Julia. We do have some other experts on here, so I appreciate yes. folks <laughs> chiming in um, with their expertise. Are there any other questions to address before I move on, Cassandra? Not right now, but I'll keep an eye on it. Okay, great. Great, great. Okay, so who buys organic? That's our, that's our next question. Uh, so, um, the Pew Research Center, which I think does a, a really, um, a really excellent job of characterizing um, consumer sentiments in a variety of, of areas, um, did a 2016 study where they were looking at both um, at how uh, how folks thought about organic, local, and GMO-free products. Um, and, and we know that when we consider organic, there are lots of other things that consumers kind of consider in this in this context. So. Um, more than two thirds of US adults report organic food purchases by their household in the past 30 days. This was in 2016, so this is a little, uh, a little dated, obviously, um, but uh, this, is, this is a pretty, pretty large number. Um, and you can see that um, if you look at the kind of ranking here, so the dark blue means is several times or about once, um, and the light blue is never. So dark, more dark blue means more purchasing, right? So we have uh, of these categories, uh, we have locally grown is the, um, the most kind of uh, prevalent here and then decided to buy based on ingredients and nutrition label and bought organic food. And then we see um, a much lower um, percentage there bought food labeled GMO free. And, uh, and you know, I, there is, I think, uh, we'll talk about consumer understanding of things, but in general, my impression is that there's not great consumer understanding that organic foods are um, required to be non-GM. So I wanna talk about, there, there are a number of studies that look at different ways to kind of uh, think about consumer. So I wanted to show you a couple of tables from these various studies that I think are really interesting, different ways to kind of characterize consumers and think about their motivations. Um, so this is uh, a, a study of US consumers um, from 2011. Again, some of, these, some of these papers are a little dated, but I only tried to pull, pull things that I thought reflected what I understood was kind of the, the kind of best science in this area. And, that I, I still think are relevant today. Um, so there are two consumer groups um, that, uh, that this study found were most likely to buy organic. And, and they're the rational consumer and the adventurous consumer um, on the left two columns. And so I've, I've put red boxes around where it talks about organic specifically, but it's important for the left two, we can see, you know, what are the other characteristics of consumers that are connected to this organic food purchasing behavior? So we see shopping at specialty stores, paying attention to labels, shopping at farmer's markets, um, and uh, value on uh, taste and healthfulness and food safety and freshness. Um, convenience and brand are less important, right? And, and so as, 
in terms for all consumers, convenience and price generally tend to be among the top uh, the top kind of uh, categories of things that are going to drive their their purchasing um, behavior. But we see that that's less important for these these folks. They're cooking often, have an interest in cooking, um, might follow some special diets or have some special kind of dietary concerns for health reasons or religious reasons. So those are some. I think that's interesting to kind of characterize um, those those consumers um, that that might be. Uh, you might, if you are marketing to consumers, you might recognize some of your consumers in these categories if you're thinking about marketing or thinking about expanding um, in certain ways. Um, these are some, some areas that you might wanna consider and focus on and use in that decision-making. And I'm gonna come back, there are some, there's a lot more that ties into why um, or into uh, who buys organic and it's here. It's why do people buy organic, right? So that was just a characterization of behaviors. Now this is, I think a nice, um, uh, a nice kind of framework that talks about some of the factors um, that, that we might include, right? Um, so factors that have to do with, um, with certification and labeling and just availability. Can you buy an organic product in your area at your preferred store? There is knowledge. Um, there are some social and demographic variables, okay, um, and there are product-related factors, um, and product-related factors are going to be perceived attributes, right, perceived attributes of organic, and we'll talk more about what those perceived attributes are, and product characteristics, right, so uh, what is the, you know, sensory characteristics is like, what is it you experience when you, when you bite into an organic apple, right, that's the, the sensory part. Um, and then this feeds into consumer preference and attitude. Then we have economic factors, which affect your ability to actually, given your preferences, purchase what you want. And then we have the purchase decision that stems from that. So I think this is a nice kind of way of, uh, of showing some of that. Now, this is also, um, so this was written by, I think, some economists. <laughs> this is written by some sociologists. And you can see they're focusing on some really different things. So I also wanted to include this to kind of talk about what are some of the motivational structures, things that people might be thinking about. And so this was a, an interesting study um, that was looking at consumer motivation for buying and consuming locally produced organic foods. So I, I do want to clarify that this is local plus organic um, that, that's being considered here. Um, and so uh, this, these authors kind of divided this up into two different motivational structures, one which is more individualistic um, and one which is more um, collectivist or, or um, altruistic. So um, in the kind of individualistic motivational structures, we have a quality motif. So focusing on, on the quality of food and, um, and this includes health, which is gonna pop up again, okay? And a symbolic kind of motif. So um, having to do with uh, regional, regional character, authenticity and, and things like that. The collectivist side, there was um, kind of an environmental motif, okay, and uh, an economic, uh, an economic motif, which, which they um, dis distinguished from the symbolic motif, right, that it's, it's this, um, not just an image, but an economic kind of impact. So I think this is another interesting way to think about, you know, for your consumers that you interact with, which motifs do you kind of think that they are, that are part of their motivational structures, right? And how can you use that, that um, understanding of their motivational structures um, to, to your advantage? Now, um, back to the Pew, uh, the Pew survey here, um, we see that consumer motivation for buying uh, organic food is largely about perceptions about health. Um, and that organic food is better um, for their health. Um, among, uh, so we see on the right-hand side, um, among those who bought organic foods in the past month, and this was in 2016 again, so past month from, from 2016, 76% per say it was to get healthier foods. 33% say it was to help the environment, okay? So that's an interesting, um, we see this health, this connection between organic and health um, uh, in, show up in a lot of different studies of consumer choice um, around, around organic. So um, this is and among the second kind of uh, panel of that says among those who say that most or some of the food they eat is organic, 88% uh, 
um, say that uh, that they are um, choosing to buy organic to get healthier foods. So the vast majority. On the left hand side, we see um, we see that the majority of Americans, so 55%, um, say organic produce is healthier than conventional produce, and 32% say it tastes better. Okay. So it's what's what's important here, and what I'm going to continue to distinguish throughout the presentation um, is that it's it's really that consumer perceptions around organic are incredibly important, and they may not always line up with what we think the impacts of organic um, actually are. And so we so both of them are important um, in in the context of how we we operate in organic markets. Um, and in addition, these perceptions of health vary. So, um, so whether consumers of organic produce think it is better for health varies with gender and with age. So I've highlighted down um, at the bottom, um, women are more likely to uh, than men uh, to think that organic produce is better for health and younger people are more likely than older people to think that organic produce is better for health. So these are just some interesting kind of differences in perceptions across demographic groups that it might be um, important to consider. I also think um, this uh, this is not U.S. consumers, and I do think it's important to be to be careful about making any um, uh, conclusions about what happens with U.S. consumers based on consumers in other countries, just because um, that cross cultural comparison isn't necessarily appropriate. But I, I did. Um, I do think this paper is really interesting because it actually talks about the different ways that people conceptualize health. And so um, this, it might not be exactly the same in the United States, but there might be different ways that people conceptualize health as well that's, that's important um, to consider. Um, so uh, this looks at these four different conceptualizations of health, which may, might be used by the same people in different settings. So health is nutritional value, health as pleasure, health as purity, and then holistic health, which also kind of looks at more of like a one health kind of a, a approach. So um, what's what's interesting here is that I've highlighted the parts again where organic food shows up. So um, health is purity is used to justify individual actions, um, qualities of organic food and holistic health is also um, used to justify qualities of organic food. And you can see that these um, uses of these conceptualizations of health show up in various kind of conversations that people have. Um, for example, debates on preferences for organic foods, um, health as purity um, is, uh, shows up uh, a lot in that. So again, these are just lots of different ways to kind of think about what is it that consumers perceive um, when they think of organic and what does that mean um, for, for um, marketing organic? Okay, now I do want to highlight that despite all of this um, and, and this perception of health, um, I, I also wanted to kind of before this presentation kind of look at the latest kind of available science about whether or not we have good evidence about, about the connections between organic um, production and health. So while there's some, my reading of the literature um, is that while there's some suggestive evidence that organic could be better for health, that evidence is mixed. Um, and even the, the uh, papers that suggest that um, argue that, um, that there needs to be more long-term or what's often called longitudinal research to understand any kind of long-term long effects, right? So, um, so this table is a table um, from a meta-analysis. So an analysis that, um, that looks at lots of other papers. So you see the numbers on the right-hand side are references to all these other papers that found, um, found differences. So this is um, looking at, uh, let's see compositional differences between organic and conventionally produced food, according to this uh, systematic review of the literature. Um, so looking at a, a lot of different studies together, you see that um, some, uh, you know, some micronutrients like vitamins are higher, um, other things, uh, proteins are lower, right? So it really um, depends on what you're looking at, whether this thing is higher or lower. There's also, you know, this paper also discusses some of the evidence on, um, on various types of, uh, of, health issues that, um, and the systematic re review around those as well, right? So, um, so this is, so there's an interesting challenge here, right? Which is that consumer perceptions are really about health. And, and certainly you could 
when it comes to organic and certainly you could kind of, you could play that up um, in your marketing, but there's not, I would say the science uh, of the connections between health and, um, and organic is not as strong as consumers' perceptions, right? And so um, that's, I think, a, a um, maybe a challenging thing in the space that each um, producer or marketer has to navigate in their in their own way um, as to how as to how you want to kind of uh, think about that. Um, and certainly, this 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 area of science, looking at the these kind of health differences, nutritional differences, et cetera, across organic and conventional and other types of production system is, is continuing. And so I think we're, we're only going to get more evidence in the future about, about what the, the, um, to give, I guess, some more evidence, we're, we're only going to get more evidence in the future about the answers to some of these questions, which are really, which are really key, right, for us um, in thinking about uh, adoption of organic and purchase of organic and marketing of organic. Zoe, I have a question. Yeah. Before you move on, I'll just yeah, sure. Um, Hi, Julia. My desk here. Hi. Yeah. Um, question about this. This is a really helpful. Um, this is a really helpful piece of information that you shared here, and I'm wondering about: Is anybody doing any kind of work, or did you see anything as you were putting this sort of um, table or sharing this sort of table, looking beyond just the health of the person? So, is there any looking at like positive externalities of organic related to community health. Do you mean like community in. public health or are you also talking about like economic impacts? No, I was thinking more in terms of like ecosystem health, like. Yeah, I, I guess th there is. So there are also studies that look at environmental um, impacts and there are, there's, there are some in studies as well that are now looking at uh, organic hotspots. So um, this was a study commissioned by the Organic Trade Association that I think Ed Tanicki and others at Pennsylvania State did that was looking at, um, you know, the economic impacts as well of when you have organic production. But to your point about the environmental impacts, um, yes, there is work on that. I think largely the findings are um, in that space uh, are that, um, well, when we look at per um, area of land, the environmental impacts look positive, but when we look at per output impacts, the environmental impacts are more ambiguous because on average, this is not true across the board, organic production has lower yields than conventional production. This is, so one of the one of the things that I've, um, that, that I've read in this space is that there's a real interest in, and maybe there are other speakers that spoke to this earlier in the semester, because we have a lot of production folks at Ohio State that are focusing on breeding and, and, um, and, and things like that. Um, that uh, there's a focus on how can we increase organic yields um, in the areas where they're where they're lower, right? Again, this is this is an average across a lot of crops, so it's not true across the board. How can we increase organic yields to ensure that um, that that is not undermining any positive environmental impacts? That low yields don't undermine positive environmental impacts of organic production. Does that make sense? Y yes. Yes. Okay. I, I feel like I'm, I might be asking a slightly different question. Okay. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. So like, I get, I think the like word that I'm fixated on is health because you yeah. said, you know, that was like a factor that was really motivating a lot of consumers. This is like mm -hmm. super interesting information that you're sharing here, by the way. Um, but I'm thinking about health in like, not in terms of like my personal health, like Julia's body, but in like terms of community health, like things that- Like this holistic health here on the right? Yeah, maybe. Health yeah. of human, the earth, humans and animals. Yes, yes. I think that's what I'm thinking about. Like that would impact our water that we all drink from, that would impact our air that we all breathe, that would impact our, um, like our stewardship kind yeah. of like values related to stewardship. That's a, that's a really good question. I think, unfortunately, I think that a lot of the research in this space is really siloed. So to get a holistic picture of the impacts, um, even in the environmental space is difficult because the people who study impacts on water are not necessarily the people who study impacts on air or not necessarily the people who study ecosystem services or soil health. And so um, I, certainly there's, there's a, a lot of research on organic. So I do not want to say at all that it doesn't 
exist um, because I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. It, it may. It's not something I've come across. Um, and and like I said, I think it's really difficult to. I, I've seen this in other in other areas as well. It's really difficult to holistically characterize some of the impacts of these different um, production systems because. They're so they're so varied and it's not necessarily clear if you had all of them that they would be additive in the sense that you could just add them up and the sum would like the whole would be exactly the, the sum it could be that there are complementary or substitute kind of relationships that occur. And so it's. I think it's it's much more complicated to study. We're I think we're now moving. I mean, a, a lot of Ohio State resources have been put into, for example, interdisciplinary research, which helps us to answer more holistic systems level questions like that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't I don't have a great a great answer for you there. I do think one of the things that tends to be at least in the economics research, one of the things that I've been really harping on is that there's not a lot of good um, research on community impacts, not necessarily thinking about health, but thinking about social, um, you know, social impacts. And um, we tend to have this kind of bifurcation where there will be a ton of sociology research about that. Mm -hmm. And then um, there'll be separate economic research that doesn't consider that. And the economists will discount the sociologists. And so there's some, there's some really um, unfortunate kind of, um, uh, kind of inter, interdisciplinary, like, uh, in a bad way, um, kind of uh, um, frictions that I think have um, maybe prevented us from as holistically looking at some of these issues. And so one of the things I'm really interested in moving forward in my research is thinking about how do we actually bring more measurement of community impacts of various, of various things? Because I also study local food systems specifically into our economic um, kind of evaluation of various policies or projects or programs or investments. Yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to keep moving, but I love I love the question, so feel free to um if it's okay with Cassandra, um I think we can use up some of our question time in the middle um when we're when we're uh, kind of um on these things. So, um okay, so which organic products do people buy? Um so first of all, so this is a this is something from the USDA Economic Research Service, which um unfortunately has not had a lot of resources the past couple of years, but they're hiring like crazy. So my hope is that we might see some more research coming out uh, of their uh, of their kind of uh, shop in the next couple of years. Um, so uh, fruits and vegetables dominate other categories of organic food sales nationally in the US. And this is a couple years old um, from, from 2017, uh, but dairy uh, is close behind. Um, we do see packaged and prepared foods um, uh, breads and grains, snack foods, some of these things um, uh, coming up, but really, or fresh fruit, fruit and vegetables is is where the and dairy are really where the most action kind of I would say uh, is happening um, in this space. But you see that every category, if you look at the size of the colored bars, every category is, is um, appears to be increasing. Um, so we just see widespread growth across um, across the categories uh, of sales. Now, then the question is, okay, given that, how much are people actually willing to pay for organic, right? And this is a key question that economists have spent a lot of time researching. So first of all, price matters. Um, price matters to all consumers. This is, we find this basically in every consumer study. It also matters to people who um, purchase organic. So um, this is not a situation where even with the highest, with, with higher income consumers that you can just, charge whatever you want because they've got plenty of income and, and they'll just pay whatever. I mean, maybe there's a subset of your consumers that will do that. But in general, like consumers care about price. Um, and so uh, so that's that's really all I wanted to to um, impart this. I guess the other one thing I want to mention, if you look at the middle where you see among those who bought organic in the past month and those who didn't buy, you see 77% um, uh, of um, consumers who didn't buy organic said that an important reason was, was the price, right? So that might've been a factor in why they didn't purchase uh, organic. Okay, so let's look at some of the premiums for organic. Um, and, uh, and this is, again, this is a little dated. This might have uh, shifted. Um, it's about 10 years old, um, but, um, but I unfortunately wasn't able to find a good graph uh, of, uh, or kind of um, good, uh, Good estimates, and then I think probably the organic um, organic survey from USDA has some some good information here. Um, but uh, this, I think, does tell you some interesting things. 
Um, so this is, we see the milk and eggs had the highest premium, meaning the percent above the non-organic price. Um, so this doesn't, so since this is in percentage terms, this is not about the absolute price of any of these goods, right? It's in terms of relative to whatever price, um, price this, this good is. So interestingly, after salad mix, we have a couple of processed products, which I find really interesting. Um, and then we have some, um, what I would say, uh, you know, salad mix often um, packaged in some way, right? So this is kind of a packaged fresh, fresh thing, or I know at farmer's markets, they'll often be like a mix, which you can get in a bag for a certain size, right? Similarly packaged in some way. Um, with carrots and potatoes and apples, these are kind of like your commodity fruits and vegetables, right? You buy them in some um, pound quantities and, and, and loose quantities here. Um, so uh, so we, see, we see that. We also see some things showing up, uh, baby food. Um, I'll mention parents again. Uh, parent, uh, parents are something to be thinking about in terms uh, of organic, organic marketing. Uh, so some interesting, I think some interesting kind of um, uh, patterns here. Uh, another thing I want to mention is this is from a, a paper um, by Christina Connolly, um, who is an OSU grad, and Alan Kleiber, who's one of my colleagues in AEDE. Um, this is from 2014, um, and uh, so they actually looked at um, at what kind of determined prices for CSA shares um, uh, and across the Midwest, and so um, they found that uh, Ohio certified organic um, uh, got a 12%, um, the prices were 12% higher um, if certified organic um, for, uh, for these CSA uh, shares. So that's what I'm highlighting um, in the red in the red box. And you can see the length of the CSA term, whether or not flowers were included um, and Pennsylvania certified organic were also some of the things that were significant here. Um, so this is a, an indicator of uh, there being this kind of premium that folks were willing to pay in this in this space for CSAs. Now, big question, right? That I said I would come back to: How much do people value organic relative to other attributes? Right. One of the questions that folks might be asking is: Do I certify? Um, do people value it? Is it important? What else do they value? How should I be characterizing my my products to reach um, to reach various markets? Um, so. Uh, this this paper again um, uh, a little older, but looks uh, at applesauce um, in uh, in Pennsylvania. So um, the consumer groups are in Pennsylvania. The product is applesauce, um, and we see that all consumer groups listed um, value local, but only some value organic. Okay, so we we can tell that because. The local, when you look at the local column that's in the red box, all the numbers are positive. For the organic box, some of the product, some of the um, of the numbers are negative. So um, for people who um, uh, are purchasing, um, we have number uh, of frequent purchases of local or organic with these various kind of knowledge scores, and um, and frequent purchase of local but not organic with these knowledge scores. So some people. Um, it looks like everybody who purchases um, uh, organic values local, but not everybody who purchases local values organic, right? That's the way to kind of um, to think about this. Um, in addition, uh, this is uh, this is a, a uh, paper written by my colleague Ariana Torres at Purdue University, um, who's doing some great work, great um, extension work in horticultural business. So I'd encourage you to check out her resources at Purdue. I think I forgot to link to them, but um, but she uh, did a uh, a survey of university students because one of the things that we really also might want to understand with consumers is you know university students are are maybe they're not consuming as much now, but they're going to be consuming more um, as they as they uh, graduate and kind of move into the workforce. So what do they what uh, do they care about? Um, so she found uh, these kind of clusters here. And so we see on the far left, there's this committed consumer group and they care a lot about organic and local and sustainability and farm size. Now the farm to fork, similar to what we saw in the last paper, right? The, there's a farm to fork group that doesn't seem to care about organic, but does care about local um, in this kind of farm to fork category and also sustainability um, and, far, and farm size. So they look very, they look, um, similar to the committed group, except a little lower on local, uh, a little lower on the things that match and a lot lower on organic kind of importance. 
And then there's kind of an unattached group um, and, a, and a highly skeptical group, right? Um, so uh, so the, the, probably the core consumers, right, uh, are the folks uh, of, of organic and then of local are gonna be those two left-hand clusters. But I would say the unattached group present, that's gonna be a group of, you know, these are potential, potential customers, right? Um, that maybe have uh, less, less information. They're not gonna be really skeptical, um, but they are, they're not yet committed to any particular kind of set of, um, of uh, purchasing patterns in this space. Okay, and this is a pretty busy, uh, busy graph, but I wanted to, or set of tables, but I want to provide it as well. So um, Jonathan McFadden and Wally Huffman um, uh, were looking, did this study of consumers. So they did what's called a choice experiment where they present people with various um, uh, types of, um, of information um, and uh, hypothetical situations and have people um, make choices situations and see how information affects the choices people make and see how various attributes of the products affect the choices that people make. Um, so uh, some interesting things here. So they looked at organic and natural. Now I'm sure everybody who's interested in organic here probably has some opinion about natural, right? And this kind of vague term and what does it mean? Why is it used? Well, interestingly, consumers really, that they do value this natural label, even though we might think it's a it's it's a vague and information uh, low information kind of um, label. Um, so we should recognize that and know that and and operate accordingly, right? Oh, uh, was there a funny comment? I missed it. I, I remember one of the speakers at the OFA conference referred to um, this and sustainability as a weasel word. <laughs> I just I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. So, um, however much we might not think that natural is a great word, I think it's important to recognize what consumers think about it and not simply um, judge consumers for for thinking that this is valid information, but rather say, okay, given that, what do we do with that? And and what can our what can our role be in educating, or what can our role be in um, in maybe presenting the value of organic differently relative to natural in order to, to kind of um, uh, help people help people understand <laughs> more what that that uh, what that label means or doesn't mean. So um, so what we see on the left is organic um, minus conventional willingness to pay differences. So willingness to pay is the measure that economists use to tell us you know what is as it sounds, folks willingness to pay. So what's the value that they place on these various attributes? On the right-hand side, we see organic and, and natural compared. So one of the interesting things that shows up is that um, when people receive um, natural industry information, so they had this treatment and um, this paper, if you link to it, or if you, again, if you can't access it, ask me for it, actually shows the information treatments if you're in, in an appendix, if you're interested to like look at what information was provided to consumers to see how that might've affected this. So um, the natural industry information um, actually uh, raised the different, uh, was valued highly um, both for natural, uh, so, but also for organic. So the organic conventional and the organic natural difference, so the difference between the value of those two um, increased when natural industry information was provided. Really interestingly to me, um, when organic industry and independent organic information was provided, the um, willingness to pay for organic relative to conventional went down. Um, so again, that could be that specifically about their information treatment and what was included in it. So I don't want to um, I don't want to say anything too broad about the results of this study, but I think that's some interesting suggestive um, evidence and could actually have to do with something I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, which is that consumers, don't actually understand what organic means. And when they do, they might actually think of it worse <laughs> than, they, than if not, right? Which is this, this frustrating um, thing uh, for anyone who's, uh, who's involved in the organic industry, I'm sure. So some other things I, wanna, um, I want to highlight. Um, so uh, years of schooling does not, um, does not seem to be um, important here, interestingly, but per capita income is. So per capita income, uh, increases the willingness to pay for organic relative to conventional or um, or natural. Um, having uh, very young children also increases the willing to, uh, the willingness to pay for organic um, and uh, and 
organic relative to conventional and natural. And it's, I think it's important to remember, I, I saw a headline somewhere, or maybe it was a, a paper, um, I decided not to actually include it, but it was something like uh, millennials, the next parents, right? So I'm a millennial. Um, I will that, right? All like people my age are parents. So if you think about what do millennials want, well, millennials are the parents, right? Right now of young children. And they're considering things like baby food. Um, and uh, Generation uh, Z is close, uh, close on our tails, already starting to have children as well, right? And so they're also the ones to think about was how are they going to take what they already think about these various labels and then kind of amplify that because things are amplified when you're a parent, right? And you're concerned about your kids and you're wanting to make really good choices for your kids, okay? Um, and the final thing that I wanted to note on this graph is um, looking at labels when buying new foods. So this actually um, increased the, uh, the organic willingness to pay relative to conventional, but not the organic willingness to pay relative to natural. So I just wanted to highlight um, this difference as well. Um, so there, I think this provides some information for um, a lot of kind of conflation of some of these various labels among, among consumers, which, which folks probably already had a sense of, um, but I think is important to, uh, important to recognize. Okay, so how can this information help your operation or you in whatever role you play um, in, uh, in the organic food system? So one thing I think that um, that this all kind of leads to is asking this question of, you know, do your customers care about certification? We've known for a long time that the cost of organic certification uh, can be a barrier um, for, for some farmers. There's this question of, you know, do I certify? Is it worth it? Um, and so uh, what I, I want to kind of point, uh, point out here is in terms of your decision that's gonna that's gonna you're gonna factor in more than whether or not your consumers care about it but it, whether your consumers care about it or not is probably something that you want to know in making that decision so i think it depends um we've we've seen that um consumers have a variety of reasons that they that they care um about organic and a variety of perceptions around organic that may be different from yours may be different from what um the best available science tells us but those are their perceptions around that so um, the, the key here is, I think, to know your consumers and what they care about. Um, are, do they care about the organic certification? Is that a signal uh, of, uh, of what things they care about? And so buyers of organic food, we, we see, are often more motivated um, to buy by concerns about personal health rather than environmental issues. So even though um, the organic standard has to do with um, environmental, um, uh, environmentally related kind of standards and, and, and processes and production characteristics, really, folks are really associating um, uh, it more with health. So um, providing more information about organic certification and what it means could entice some new customers with environmental concerns. At the same time, what we just saw is it could actually, um, depending on what that information treatment looks like, drive some people away who have more of an association with, with health or, or, um, or other things that aren't really at least at the outset, what the organic standard was about, right? Um, another thing I wanna mention quickly here is heuristics. So um, most customers um, use heuristics when shopping. So these are mental shortcuts that we use to make decisions more easily. And I'm sure every one of us can mention a couple, can think of a couple examples from our own life, right? Especially right now with COVID, what we're seeing is people are using heuristics more than ever because they're more time constrained, they're more stressed, and you tend to use heuristics more in that kind of setting. So organic serves as a heuristic cue for some consumers. Um, and local production and natural are other examples of these heuristic cues. So the thing to think of them as is not necessarily like there's this label and I know all the information about the label and that's why I purchased this. It's that this label conveys something to me. I use a mental shortcut to say this conveys something about quality or about you know, uh, what I think is healthy or freshness and I'm gonna use that um, as a cue and, and make my purchase decision accordingly. So it doesn't necessarily mean that people understand the actual impacts or processes behind these labels. They may or they may not. So an, an interesting thing to ask is what do your customers think organic means, right? This is something that you could ask your, your um, existing, existing customers. Um, what is it that they value about organic? It may be different from what you think um, the, the reason for adopting organic would be. And understanding that reasoning for, um, for valuing organic could help you think about how to, how to market things in the future. 
Another key question, should you consider new types of labels? There's been a variety of kind of um, new, uh, new labels considered, you know, one of the um, significant ones in my mind is there's really a push toward a regenerative agriculture um, certification with the idea that the, um, that the current organic standard is that people are, um, are meeting the letter, but not the spirit of the organic production regulations. And so could regenerative agriculture or some other kind of certification that goes beyond organic uh, help with that? Now, again, I think the value to consumers of these new labels depends on what consumers think they convey, right? And so um, again, what consumers think may, always, may not always line up with the true meaning. Um, information could help, but only if consumers are willing to spend time understanding these labels, right? We saw earlier, there were some people that say, I read labels, some people that say, I don't. The people. Why didn't they read the sign? And he says, most people don't read signs. <laughs> um, so, and this is, this is true of our consumers too, right? Many people um, are, not, are not reading um, the information even when it's provided. So we have to understand which is a group of consumers that do and which is a group of consumers that don't. Um, again, this is, I think, a place to ask existing consumers um, and to do some market research in your existing or potential markets, right? To, um, to really understand who is it that you're trying to market to and what do, they, um, what do they want? What would they value in terms of these labels? If you find, for example, a distrust of the organic label, then that might be an opportunity to think about, okay, maybe there's another label that goes beyond that that people would value, right? And that's, that's maybe a time to, uh, to use that. Now, one other thing I want to mention here is that I think, um, you know, I, I don't think I put this in the slides, but um, I, you know, I do a lot of research on local and my perception with, um, with research on local um, is that really trust, that personal element of trust is the key, is a key piece. So what's interesting, I think there um, is that uh, the, we, we should really also think about the role that labels play and when labels are really convey important information versus when they're kind of a substitute for something else. So um, in my mind, labels are this um, can convey important information when you aren't there talking to a consumer to say, this is what I did, right? But when we have that personal connection, and, and I've seen this anecdotally, and maybe some folks on the call know more about this, that, um, you know, uh, farmers at farmers markets saying like, yeah, I, you know, I don't certify anymore because the, the trust, the personal connection, the ability to have a conversation with people and they know where my farm is and they can, they can um, yell at me if they don't like something, right? That connection is kind of a substitute for providing a label. But in a longer supply chain, when you're not connecting directly to the consumer, the label conveys information that you can't convey yourself, right? So I think it's also important to, to, consider, to consider that. Okay, and where should you market your foods? Well, some of the um, some of what we've seen um, in the data so far, right? Mentioned specialty stores, right? There are there are people that are um, that are focused on organic that are shopping at specialty stores. This is going to mean a variety of things depending on where you are. I know that's kind of a vague a vague term, um, but as opposed to your um, your kind of super centers and your supermarkets, right? Um, uh, I would say. Um, We've seen huge growth um, of online sales this year. Um, this is still this is an area that I think um, will be higher than it was pre-COVID going forward. Maybe come down a little bit from from where it was. And I know a lot of people, including Ofa, are thinking about you know how uh, how do we help build a digital infrastructure for our farmers. Um, but this is a space that I think we need to continue to to help um, work on and support people in. Um, I think depending on what customers are and consumers value, restaurants, institutions, and direct-to-consumer outlets um, could uh, are, are are good uh, places to consider. But really, I think it's going to be very dependent on the out the specific outlet and what they what they want. So if you have specific folks that you're working with, like if you sell to Ohio State Dining Services or you sell to a hospital or you sell at a farmers market, I think it's particularly important to understand that market in determining. Um, whether or not you should label certain ways, um, whether or not they value um, having a certified product. Okay, and uh, just wanna wrap up a couple of resources. Um, there's a lot out there. These are some national resources and I've provided hyperlinks to all of them. Cassandra's gonna post the slides um, on the offer website um, after the talk. 
Um, and I've also included some Ohio specific resources um, that I think are, are, um, are valuable. Um, and uh, of course, uh, OFA uh, being a certifier, uh, I've linked to your, your certification um, site uh, there. So um, that's it, that's all I've got for you. Feel free to um, follow up with me for any questions, for requesting any of these articles if you're interested to dig into them. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to take any more questions uh, if we have time. I'm not sure what time we're at because I haven't been paying attention, but. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're at 11.50, but if you're willing to stay, um, you know, if people need to uh, jump off, I'm sure they can. That's the great part. Wonderful. I'm usually pretty good about time. I, I got really into it and Julia's <laughs> comment questions just, uh, <laughs> we're very, we're exciting. So um, I'm happy to, no, I'm happy to Good around. discussion, yeah. Thank you I, for your patience, for your, um, allow me to go a little over. So um, I will post the um, slides and the recording of this talk later today. Uh, that will be on the, um, the go.osu.edu organic dash series website. I did put that in the chat. So um, you can have access to this to watch it again and um, click right on these links that she provided. So um, were there some other questions um, out there? Don't see anything in the chat. I mean, I have more, but I didn't want to. <laughs> feel, feel free. We feel free. I'm, always, day, I'm right? always that person too, Julia. I'm like, oh no, is everyone going to be upset that I have more questions? So what feel free. This? Yeah. Like, no, I don't want, if anybody else has questions though, go first because I already asked one or two. Okay. I'll go. I say um, go first. Yeah. So, okay. So getting back to your point about this is awesome by the way like so helpful thank you oh you're um, welcome thank you visuals and like really appreciate all the links too um so okay so your point about like consumers are motivated by health they choose organic because of health but if they actually knew what organic was they might not choose it i think that's a really interesting point and I think it's like something we talk about in organic policy is like the Achilles heel of organic. Mm -hmm. Like if people knew that mm -hmm. little baby chicks were given or, you know, were given antibiotics before their first day of life, like would people still want to buy organic eggs as much as they do? Or like if people knew that, mm -hmm. like, and I could go through my 12 favorite things right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do we do about that? Because if we had consumer pressure to make those standards stronger, to close those loopholes that exist, we would be so much more effective in doing so. But if the consumer doesn't know, and if the consumer knowing turns them against organic, like how do we bridge that gap in practice of providing the information, empowering people to like fix things and not mm -hmm. blowing, you know, not throwing out the baby with the bathwater because organic is good in very many ways, but it's definitely not perfect. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, I, I don't think I have an easy answer for you. I really wish that, I don't know if there are any psychologists on, but I feel like this is kind of a, a um, I, I would love the help of somebody who actually studies some of the kind of these questions in the context of psychology. Um, but uh, I think that there's a, a couple of things I would say. First is that um, I one of the things that I find interesting is that we have a lot of we have a lot of issues in our food system broadly, right? Outside of organic. Like you mentioned a couple of things that are the Achilles heel, but there's a lot of things that people don't know in general about the food system. And so there's this really, I mean, I, I think there's this really interesting situation of, you know, you have, let's let's say conventional, I know it's it's a broad brush and I don't want to lump every producer who's not organic into this, it, you know, I recognize they're different. But if you have this kind of um, conventional conventional production, and then you have organic production, and then you have, you know, things that you think could be better in organic production, things that you think could be better in conventional production. I mean, I think the issue is that when, if people get information that, and they have a really, really good view of organic, right? Really highly positive and potentially, you know, with some of these consumers, a highly negative view of, uh, of um, the con kind of conventional foods, then any good information about conventional foods will just make it better. Any, any in kind of, 
information about organic foods is going to maybe make their perception worse just because they were holding it on such a high pedestal before. <laughs> right. And so I, I think that's kind of, that's kind of what you're saying. And so part of it, I mean, I, I wonder if, um, part of this has to do with helping people understand what organic does do, right? This is a framing question of what is, what does organic do versus, um, versus what it, what it doesn't do. Um, at the same time though, your point about education is, um, it is a good one. And, you know, in general, I would say, um, there's, there's a value that people place on transparency. Now, I don't want to say, I feel like I would be a little worried to say, yeah, just be totally transparent. People understand. Cause we know that like, that's not how people take in information. Um, but, but I think there's an opportunity to be both, you know, organic is great. Let's make it better in these ways, like a way to positively frame things, but also be transparent. And I think that's the combination, um, that I would, that, that I think is good, like building on the strengths of organic, right. And recognizing that there are strengths, um, but also being transparent because ultimately like you're saying you have, like people have to know, uh, about what the issues are to be able to change them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, and, and the, the worst situation is if they find out from somebody else and organic looks like the bad guy, right. Right. Like, like a journalist, you know, we're seeing some really great journalism in the food space right now, but you know, and organic is, has all these problems with an expose, right. Something like that is really, is really bad for organic, but you might've already known that all those issues were there, right. That they, that they expose. Mm -hmm right? Yeah, exactly. Like your list of 12 things, right? Those Achilles heels, you might've already known that, right? But if that, if consumers get that from, I don't know, an Atlantic article say, um, then they will, then they might see kind of the organic industry as the bad guy in that. So I think can, you know, this is going to sound very PR-y and maybe may, might've maybe a public relations and maybe a negative way, but like, I think that there's some, some, um, something to be said for the organic industry controlling the narrative there rather than letting somebody else potentially um, find those Achilles heels and exploit them in some way. Yeah, so like don't call the New York Times, but get together with your group of organic advocates and out the things that need to be outed and how to fix them. Like with- Right, and work on, but again, this positive framing of like, we think organic is great and we want to make it better. I mean, I think one of the, I think one of the good things, regardless of where these new labels come from, I think one of the things that's, I think this, this kind of activity that's happening for new labels is due to some concerns about organic. And so one of the, one of, and that, you know, that regardless of where people are, regardless of what people know about those labels, somebody might read something that's about, you know, somebody arguing for regenerative agriculture, and that might actually cause them to go from, they might read the headline and it says, you know, what is organic really doing? Not that much, something like that. They read that headline, they stop buying organic entirely. They're not moving to regenerative that actually negatively creates a negative image for organic, right? Um, and so I guess um, what, uh, what I think, um, you know, it's easy uh, for, you know, for all the folks who've been really working really hard in the organic um, industry and organic markets and, and marketing this is to be on the defense around some of these new labels, right? Um, so some folks might be supportive and say like, yeah, we agree that this is something to support. Some folks might be on the defense and say, no, or, you know, um, like stop trying to undermine organic, right? And so, you know, maybe that's a natural re human response, I think, right? To be on the defense <laughs> in, in that kind of situation. But ultimately you can turn that around, right? And you can, um, you can say um, that uh, you could, go on the off, not on the offense, but instead to say, yeah, you're right, let's make it better, right? And that would be kind of incorporating that information. We're seeing, you know, that's just in our society as a whole right now, there's a lot of conversations that folks are having where people are on the defense about a wide variety of issues. And so a lot of reframing um, to, okay, yeah, like let's pause, 
let's make it better, I think can help incorporate some of the issues that people are, are talking about. But first, you know, um, there might be some uncomfortable conversations among your kind of community <laughs> about how to do that, right? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. That's You're welcome. That was a really long answer to your question, but I was just kind yeah, of thinking through it as I was talking. <laughs> Good discussion though. Um, we've got a comment about um, using organic oil as um, in place of an antibiotic. And I, this might be um, something for Julia to discuss, but I, I know like in the research space here at the university, I, I feel like organic growers are often looking for kind of a magic bullet, maybe especially people who've transitioned recently. They're looking for things to replace the way they used to do things when they're conventional, you know, things to replace antibiotics and herbicides that are quick and easy. And, you know, it, maybe they work, maybe they don't, but I think they often get pushed out there before they've been researched a lot. But um, I don't know, Julia, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm not sure if this is an organic specific question. And do you want to unmute and tell us more about what you're thinking here? Like, is this is this a, like a general animal husbandry question or is this an organic specific question? I don't know if you can get off mute. If you're on a phone and it's star 69. So I'll just, or Julia, did you wanna? Did no, you go wanna ahead. I'm, not, I'm not quite sure if it's okay. really even. Go, you go first. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, this is, this is hard. I mean, this is, this talks to the kind of production side um, and, you know, how do we, you know, how do we continue to innovate um, in terms of, of production and how do we know um, when, uh, when, you know, there's some new um, kind of uh, idea about, about an, an intervention, um, how do we know uh, whether or not it it works, um, and how do we incorporate that? Who do we trust, um, and how do we get that information? I think that's incredibly hard. Something to offer, I know, is trying to work on. Um, uh, you know, uh, I guess my you know my thought as a social scientist is that you know uh, we we know that rigorous science takes a long time and that can be really frustrating with the adoption of a new technology or intervention. Um, you know, you have to make the choice that's the best for your operation. I would encourage you to, um, to find seminars like this. I'm glad you're here. Um, uh, extension uh, um, presentations uh, that are relevant to your operation to try to ask the people who know the science in this, in this area. I know reading, um, reading scientific papers just directly is like not they're they're inaccessible to me and I have a PhD right like so many right so I, I get that that's not something I would expect anyone to do um who's who's not an academic um and so um so look for opportunities like this um you know and and you know look not only at Ohio State but there's going to be great you know maybe Ohio State extension doesn't have um, a specialty and all the things that you're interested in. Um, look across the land grant universities, look at what Purdue's doing, look, look to see if there are extension um, op, you know, opportunities, especially right now, all of it is online, right? More than ever. And I think it's gonna continue. And so the accessibility, um, not that I wanna send people away from Ohio State, but like we're not the best in everything, right? We have some specialties, we know some things, other people know a lot of things too. And, um, and so, you know, look for some of the, the, um, the places that have specialties in what you are interested in um, and see if you can attend extension webinars through them to learn some of this information. It might be, you know, if you're working with a, a vet or a nutritionist or somebody, like not all of this information is gonna, you know, they're not gonna have all this new information at their fingertips. So you might want to, be, you know, an early adopter of something that is not yet standard practice. Um, and, you know, we have seen in, in this, this is true of a number of technologies, by no means all, but with some technologies, we see that first, there are some people who are early adopters, and then a scientist finds out about it and says, you're doing what? Well, I want to test that. And then they test it. And then a couple of years later, extension is out and, and marketing that and saying, yeah, people should adopt this. We have shown that it works. So, 
that, you know, you have to make the decision of when to adopt something that's best for your, for your operation. Um, but I absolutely like to the extent that you can, I, I would encourage you to follow, you know, to also continue to follow um, the science if you want to be using innovative methods so you can ensure that you are, you know, presumably you have a goal with that method, um, why you're using it. So you can ensure that those goals that you have for your operation are being met through the methods that you're using. Yeah, and management really plays in here too. Um, you know, you got to balance the costs, you've got to track the results. And, um, you know, when you're adopting a new practice, you should always be watching to see what the impacts are. So in a systematic way. Yeah, and Anne, I reread this a couple times while Zoe was making a lot of good points about like looking across extension. Sometimes extension doesn't have research on things that we wish it had research on because this research is that's not fundable. Um, so like homeopathic treatments, for instance, not something that there's a lot of peer reviewed literature on. There are folks though in the industry who've done a lot of work with homeopathic treatments and like we have a number of certified operators at OFA who do use homeopathic work on their animals. The key in a certified context is just making sure to run whatever that is, like say it's oregano oil that you'd like to try with your flock or your hogs or whoever, um, just running that by the materials review specialist to make sure that it's allowed for use in organic production before you would do that so that you don't end up like impacting your organic certification of the animals. And then like Cassie said, paying really close attention to like what happens after that? Does this make sense as a preventive? I mean, there are a lot of preventive health measures that are allowed for use in organic production because it is a systems approach, right? We're not trying to like put out fires. So um, if you have some sort of like health boosting supplement that's allowed for use in organic production, like I would say that would be really in keeping with the practices of an organic system. And I think just because we don't have research on something isn't necessarily a reason to rule it out. It certainly would be better if we did, but it's just not all fundable, unfortunately. So I don't know. That's a great point, Julia. That's totally true. I agree with that. And and yeah, the in the cases where it's where there's not, I mean the the you know technical support I guess I would I would consider, you know, one of the things that OFA does is this technical assistance in this space, right? Um, as one of the great kind of networkers in this space in Ohio is is great to reach out to to and maybe you can get connected with other farmers who are trying this technology. Yeah, that's what I was going to say too. I have not personally used oregano oil, but I'm, I know like who the producers are who use homeopathic treatments, and I'm sure we could hook you up with somebody who might have some firsthand experience. So through the farmer to farmer approach. Yeah. So appreciate this information today, Zoe. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all who are, who are here with us. Um, today. Well, oh, I think we'll, um, we'll cut it there. It's after <laughs> yeah. time for lunch, right? <laughs> so thank you again um, to everyone who joined us and to our presenters and uh, great conversation today. Um, we'll, uh, this is the last of these sessions, but they are online if you want to see what you missed and, um, and uh, watch them on YouTube. They are there and available. So and thank you, everyone, and uh, I'll